Yeah, so before I kick off our with our main topic for this session today, I would like to take, start off with a big thank you to our audience and founders who have joined us today for our Genesis Meet the Founders sharing session. I hope you all have enjoyed all the topics discussed on our forum so far. So my name is Eddie, Head of Investments and Portfolio at Genesis, and I'll be your moderator for this session today. So for our audience, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to share your questions with our trailblazing founders by scanning the pigeonhole QR code on my screen, on the screen, or access the pigeonhole link where you can post all your questions. So the passcode for the Q&A link will be below the will be below the QR code on my screen. So today for our 30 minute session, today we will it will revolve mainly around Indonesia, Southeast Asia leading domestic market with more than 275 million people, especially given our portfolio companies and their founders we have here today, have their, all their key operations mainly in Indonesia. So our main topic for this session will be about ketahanan, which really means resilience in Bahasa of our fellow Indonesian popular companies, especially during this trying period during the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me start off this session by doing a quick round of introduction of our popular founders here in this room. So first, we have Eka, president and co-founder of Tani Hub, who has joined us all the way from Jakarta. So Tani Hub is a B2B mission-driven farm-to-table agri-tech startup that aims to provide inefficient aims to improve inefficient food supply chains in Indonesia by making it easier for smallholder farmers to directly connect with buyers through their online marketplace. So apart from this, they also operate an agriculture crowdfunding platform called Tani Fund to provide their farmers with alternative financing from the broader public. Next up, we also have Jake, CEO and co-founder of Red S, an Indonesia-focused social commerce platform that empowers micro-entrepreneurs, especially in tier twos and tier three cities in Indonesia to start their own online business by leveraging on their social networks without requiring capital or holding inventory. And last but not least, we also have Guillaume, CEO of Happy Fresh. So Happy Fresh is one of our, uh, one of the Southeast Asia leading on online grocery delivery platform with a marketplace style aggregator model that offers customers with a wide range of products. They are sold at the supermarkets of their retail partners. So thanks for joining us today, Eka, Jake, and Guillaume. We are super privileged to have partnered you in all our growth journey so far. So since we have an audience of investors and entrepreneurs here in this room, why don't you all give our audience a quick background of your company and update us on the exciting things that have happened in the past year. Let's start with you, Eka. Then we can go to Jake and Georg. Over to you, Eka. Okay, thank you, Eddie. So hi, everyone. Uh, probably um, as what Eddie was explaining, so we are um, agriculture supply chain uh, platform. So we help farmers from uh, uh, like getting their uh, uh, cultivation, um, worked and we and well, when they harvest we help uh, find the market for them and in between we help on the process of sorting packing and distributing um, their farm produce so so far you know like we we have experienced like a, over 600 percent of growth um, during um, 2020 and this is caused because you know a lot of people who previously did not trust like buying fresh produce online now, you know, like they, they start uh, trying, you know, because they're afraid to go out. So they start trying to purchase um, and procure their fresh produce like online. And they, uh, they're happy because, you know, they get better prices. They get um, just as fresh uh, produce as if they go to the wet market. And they don't need to uh, basically leave um, their house or their, uh, their uh, business because uh, we deliver it to them uh, first thing in the morning. So that's ha that has been the most exciting thing. Also, um, you know, uh, between 
2000, um, early 2020 and, and until now we've onboarded more than 50,000 far new farmers um, uh, like on our platform. So that has been exciting and also challenging at the same time for us. How are you, Jake? I mean, can you give our audience a quick background of your company and update us on whatever exciting has happened over the sure. last year? Sure. Um, yep, so I'm Jake, uh, CEO and co-founder of uh, Red S. So Red S is essentially a membership-based social commerce platform focusing in T2 and T3 Indonesia. So what I, what I, what do I mean when I say like membership-based? Uh, think of it like Costco, right? Like you have to pay membership and then uh, you, people go to Costco and Walmart for different reasons. So we are a platform that, it's, um, that we have product catalogs. So the platform is actually agnostic. Uh, we actually work with Dining Hub. You know, fresh produce is actually one of our categories on our platform. So besides fresh produce, we also have FMCG, digital products, um, physical e-commerce goods from you know, foreign suppliers and local suppliers. So that was, that's what I mean when I say like, you know, platform agnostic. Why do, I, why do we do that? It's because um, our users, essentially, it's actually resellers. They, are, they have different kind of uh, customer, right? And their audiences, different preferences, you know, uh, ranging from high frequency kind of uh, things that they sell to, you know, mid frequency. Yeah, so this, those are the different kind of things that it's uh, on our platform as our catalog. Now, the key here is uh, we allow them to resell products from their mobile devices by having their own shop. So in this aspect, having their own shop, essentially, it's like a mobile Shopify, right? Except that, you know, you don't have to worry of um, what do I put on my website to sell. Now, you have the things that uh, Ray S passes you as a catalog to sell. You have a shop link. And then, uh, you know, it's very easy for them to just push it through WhatsApp, Messenger, Instagram, having their own online shop, or even, you know, putting up their shop on local marketplaces. Uh, over the past year, I think uh, we have benefited from some sort of tailwind, right? Because uh, our value proposition from launch was actually work from home, earn from home. Yeah, this, that's just a very simple sentences. But previously, you know, the, 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 uh, the keyword for this is actually uh, quite hard, right? You have to pay quite a bit, you know, for work from home, earn from home to actually appear on Google Ads. <laughs> but suddenly, you know, in 2020, you, you see like a 90% to 100% increase in traffic when people searching for uh, these kind of keywords. Yeah, so that's just one little uh, funny thing, right? That happened for Red Apps. So if you look on like Google searches and whatnot, or even like um, Play Store, you see that for the keyword reseller, uh, Red S is number one, right? Even on any searches and whatnot. Yeah, so I think we, we kind of benefited from this. Uh, also with the pandemic, uh, the platform has actually provided plenty of opportunities for Indonesians that have been laid off, right? One way or another, affected by the pandemic. Uh, they, are able, they are able to supplement their household income, right? So for a top reseller, they are able to bring extra $400 USD, right? Per month. Yeah, and that's actually quite significant for the cities that we are focusing in. Yeah, so we have... Uh, I think a good year, you know, we grew about seven times, 7% <laughs> in revenue. And then, uh, and I think most of our resellers actually, you know, um, benefited you know, from what Red S uh, did for them. Yeah, I think yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Exciting times, Jake. Over to you, Guillaume. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, so uh, my, my name is Guillaume, uh, CEO of uh, Happy Fresh. Uh, Happy Fresh is uh, what we do is actually very simple. We just bring the groceries to you. Um, so you don't need to, you know, get stuck in traffic. You don't need to carry your heavy items. Um, you don't need to queue at the supermarket. And we do that in Indonesia. We do that in Malaysia. We do that in Thailand. Um, we partner now with more than 200, 200 uh, different partners. We operate from more than 1,000 stores. Um, and I think what we base our, our, our really our value proposition, what we think is the same way as, as as a customer would think about groceries, right? We want to make sure that you can get everything. So it's all about range and assortment. And that goes from all the fresh produce that has been mentioned all the way to any kind of food and household items. Um, we also want to do it this in a very, very convenient manner. So you can get your order delivered in the next 30 to, to one hour, all the way to schedule. Um, and then we make sure that you get the best price uh, or the best value for money. So we partner with our supermarkets, but also with brands and FMCGs all the way to banks. So you just get the best deal. 
Um, by doing that, I think we build probably what is what is now a, um, a recognized household brand. Where you get in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in Thailand, like you think about uh, e groceries, definitely think about Happy Fresh, and um, we serve as up to today millions of, of customers and families, and that still stay with us. Actually, ninety percent of our of our orders are repeat customers, which uh, make us very very happy. And uh, definitely, 2020 has been a, a tipping point. I think not only for us, but for overall digitalization, Southeast Asia, and and services like ours. In the context of a pandemic, where you know we've all been locked down for way too long, um, we build different type of habits, um, and obviously those habits are a little bit different to what we used to do before. Um, and um, and I think those habits obviously are are, are here to stay. Um, when you I think unlock the level of convenience of platforms like from Tiny Hub, uh, Great, uh, Happy Fresh, and, and many others. It's difficult then to go back to the, the the hassle of some of the chores that otherwise we needed to do on a weekly basis. So, yeah, look, super happy to to obviously uh, be here. Um, um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it. Thanks, Gil. Very insightful from you. So, one question from me, right? So. I mean, Indonesia has, is a home of to a many growing number of startups, right? Which I know there's also several unicorns, including Gojek, Tokopedia, Bukalapak, and Traveloka, right? So while Indonesia offers many opportunities for startups like ourselves, however, we all know that doing business in, in Indonesia is not easy. So especially given the complexity of rules, regulations, the accounting and taxation, right? So my my question to all of you here, right? How do you how do you and your team pursue sustainable growth while managing risk in a highly localized market like Indonesia? Eka, do you like to start off first? Yes. Um, okay. So that's a that's a good question, and also um, maybe for us it's a little bit uh, of a different um, kind of uh, way of thinking. Because for us, because we're a very like localized um, startup and the problems that, that we are solving is very Indonesian um, since the Indonesian uh, agricultural supply chain is very inefficient and fragmented. So we actually have a lot of support from the government. So uh, we're actually we're actually confused that, like uh, how to how to manage um, like all this support that the, the government's trying to give us. And we're just like, okay, wait, you know, like, uh, like uh, one by one and um, for us, like we're very lucky and, and thankful that um, actually the Indonesian um, uh, government right now they're they're trying their best and and you know since food and ketahanan for food is actually one of the the main priorities uh, for um, the president's term. So like um, you know uh, from the Ministry of Trade, they're trying to help us um, ease in like any kind of regulations related to trade and export. Ministry of Agriculture has been supporting us like uh, whatever kinds of uh, inputs, uh, seedlings and uh, anything that, you know, that can help the farmers cultivate uh, better quality products. Also like the, um, the region governments, uh, like for example, the governor of, the, of um, Central Java, of West Java and also uh, East Java, they're trying their best to, to build um, any facilities that we might need that can help um, the local farmers there. You know to speed up on their process of sorting because right now everything is like really uh, manual um so like we're actually overwhelmed uh, and, and and trying to manage um so that we can um, speed up our growth but also um, be in line with the programs of the government so one key thing that i see um in in indonesia is like um first uh, if you have a business and it's aligned with uh, what um, the, the government has, um, you know, on its top priority programs, you will get a lot of support. And, um, but also you have to be able to manage, you know, educate them too, because um, a lot of them just know, okay, the president says, uh, like, these are the initiatives, like, let me do it like that. But you have to also tell them, okay, this is the way you have to give them uh, support on like um, research and also um, like execution plans. Um, so yeah, if you can get those two um, well, you know, linked, then then you know you have you have um, like a really good um, uh, path, you know, towards um, like growth. So so that's like from from our side. Thanks, Eka. 
Guillaume, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, um, I think uh, for, for us, like in Indonesia is a, an extremely complex market in many different uh, dimensions, I would say. Um, first, from a, a geographical extension, it's, it's still, it's like a 16,000 island type of uh, country um, with many different cultural difference within the country, um, extremely fragmented when it comes to different class. And if you boil this down into, into retail or even groceries, right, there's probably no one uh, in the modern retail that, that is a clear leader in terms of market share. None of them, I think, has more than 10, 15 percent. So all this complexity and fragmentation really is a, is a playground for, for an aggregator like us, right, which I think that's, that's how the design choice of making this model, where the idea was to bring all this different diversity, all this different optionality into one platform to really enable the customer to pick and choose whatever they feel is the best for them. Whereas, you know, it's the price point, uh, whether it's the branding, whether it's the quality, whether it's like even where you locate it. Um, so, so that's one aspect of it. Um, second aspect of it is obviously, as you will say, everything that you have to navigate from a uh, corporate structure, taxes perspective, uh, you know, work permits and why not. Um, I think the best way we, we've managed that is our team. Uh, I think Indonesia team is uh, today like 60, 65 people, um, 64, uh, it's at Indonesian. So it's a very, very incredibly localized team. Um, and the idea here is obviously you need to know what the market wants and the best way to do so is by having people that are the market. Um, and then obviously that eases a lot of things up um, when it comes to structuring as well. Um, the third point, I think, as, as, uh, as uh, was mentioned before, I think uh, over the past couple of years, especially, I think uh, our Indonesian government has been very supportive of encouraging entrepreneurship both from educational standpoint at the schools, um, all the way up to supporting uh, companies like, like that that really starting up something. Um, and I think that obviously had helped um, into bringing, uh, you know, from, 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 from different type of workforce, different helps, uh, innovation as well. And I think it's definitely the right direction. Indonesia is and would be a, a hub for, for many, many things. And I hope that also becomes a hub when it comes to talent, it becomes a hub when it comes to innovation. Um, because if, if, if we manage to really drive this forward at the speed and direction we're going, um, is definitely one of the most powerful engines that Southeast Asia would have in the future. Thanks, Guillaume. So before I go to Jake, you, you Jake, right? Uh, I would like to remind our, our audience also that if you have any questions for our founders, please feel free to access the pigeonhole link where you can post all your questions. And the passcode for the Q&A link is also is G E N A L T B E N one. Okay, over to you, Jake. Any thoughts on on how you do you sustain growth in this challenging and Indonesian market? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> I think that's the that's a bot question every quarter. <laughs> <laughs> it's like one of the toughest questions, right? Sustainable growth, uh, you know, uh, at any for any company, I mean, um, every company that you know is doing business, uh, I think we ask ourselves these questions a lot of time. Uh, but you know, specifically to answer the high localized market like Indonesia, right? I think uh, my top answer would be like very similar to Happy Fresh. Uh, so we have seventy three people right now in the company. Um, you know, 55 or so, it's uh, local, right? Indonesia, yeah. And then, you know, the slightly less than 20, it's uh, actually engineers, yeah. Uh, reason being why, you know, we choose to work with, uh, you know, Singapore engineers is because uh, I think, you know, me and my co-founders, we started in Singapore and then, you know, we have a lot of um, network within the comp science uh, department. And that's why, you know, we feel like, hey, this is a, uh, it's something that we can work with. So for product wise, uh, we prefer to work with locals, but everything else, uh, it's all in Indonesia, right? So the key here is actually uh, what we say, it's finding the right people to traverse the complexity because only the locals know the rules and regulation really, really well, right? And, and we say that we want to focus in T2 and T3. Those cities are actually much, um, it's not so easy for us, right? To penetrate 
you know, and then actually start a local community there and whatnot. So you have to hire people there. Um, my second answer, right, to tackle the word sustainable growth is actually to monitor UE, right, unit economics, and then cash flow, right, these two things. When you have your UE well and your cash flow, you know, well managed, ah, that is where growth is, you know, sustainable. Yeah. And then the last bit that I will add on, is actually a uh, retention. Yeah. So, you know, growth at all costs is easy, right? <laughs> uh, but how do you get them to continuously use, you know, your product after you acquire them for the first time? Uh, that is uh, one of the toughest questions, right? I think that every founder has to answer. Uh, luckily for us, right, the social commerce model itself, uh, you know, we can toggle and tweak marketing spend. Yeah, instead of like, you know, just spending excessively on like, you know, Google Ads or Facebook digital marketing or, you know, the TV ads. Um, before we pour money into acquisition, we actually make sure that retention is at ideal level. And if it's not at a, you know, 20, 25% kind of <clears throat> uh, target that we are at, then we stop, right? We are, we are okay with growing slower as long as, you know, it's sustainable. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's like at least great STC on this aspect. Yeah. I see. So a little bit on, on the people topic, right? Let's switch gear a bit, a little bit. Um, so I know that throughout 2020, you know, the pandemic has, has had a de devastating impact on humanity right, across the globe. Um, but one positive outcome has always been on the impact on digitalization. So then the startup ecosystem in Indonesia has actually survived 2020. Um, and many have actually thrived during this pandemic, right? So, you know, Given that consumption via digital channels have become more per pervasive, service, serving everyday needs. So I think our audience would also like to hear from you all. How have you and your team powered through 2020? And if you can, please share some of the hacks that have worked for you and your team during this tough period, especially with the PSBB restrictions. Guillaume, do you want to take this question? Please come, come, come again. I like it broke out for like just the last 30 seconds. <laughs> no, don't worry. Let me, let me repeat my question. So, I mean, I think the, can you please share some of the hacks that you have that work for you and your team, especially during this tough period with the PSBB restrictions in Indonesia? Um, I, 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 I don't think during that time there is many hacks that work rather than really spending a lot of time trying to, to uh, you know, for uh, more than a hack or not. So I think we were incredibly lucky that at the time our traffic uh, to buy groceries online because of the lockdowns were happening and that we had to increase massively our operations and increase our fleet was the exact time that the transportation uh, use case was dropping because people were not going to the office or why not. So we had the chance to hire um, a lot of the Grab, Gojek um, drivers uh, that were losing their job. And then we would basically uh, convert them into a happy fresh uh, drivers. So the talent pool uh, was actually really, really big for us to tap into them at the right time. Um, that's not a hack, it's just really being lucky and um, that's probably one of the one of the best situations that we've had um, in terms of scaling up our fleet and the fastest uh, that we've ever done it. Um, and and that just basically because we could access to that already train um, accessible uh, talent pool. Um, another thing, by the way, that we did during during this 2020 in the and the pandemic is that. Um, we completely stopped marketing, uh, performance marketing, any type of marketing. And we start doing what we call, uh, we start calling it social marketing. So instead of us betting for keywords, instead of us paying Facebook and Google to advertise, put happy fresh all around so people can be like, okay, I'm locked down at home. Let me just, you know, we pass all that marketing to the customer. And throughout the lockdown period, we offer free delivery for certain number of orders. So basically we were helping people to not go out, um, to stay being safe um, and providing what we call social marketing rather than paying Facebook and Google of the world for the same awareness that we would have reached probably anyways. That's more than a hack is also a way to, I think, utilize your capital efficiently while doing something good on the way in a time where people are probably quite, quite suffering. And, I think the third thing um, was that um, we also had to scale our personal shoppers. So 
in our model, what we have is people in the stores, in the supermarkets, they only do picking uh, for you. They, we call them personal shoppers. Um, so we had a partnership with some of the different Indonesian F&B groups and that they were also closing down a lot of the uh, a lot of the outlets because people were not going out for dining and we temporarily hired them um, for three months, six months um, during the, the time that these restaurants were closed. So they would not lose the, their jobs. Um, and the moment the restaurants were open again, we basically, you know, pass them, pass them back. Uh, again, because at that time also maybe our volumes were adjusting it. So by doing that, I think um, our team was incredibly proud of doing that because we were probably, we, we avoid a lot of people staying out of job. And a time like this, I think such a social crisis that underneath all the health uh, crisis, but it's just extremely more, I think that social crisis, being able to help a little bit was, was really important for the team. I see. Uh, Eka, do you have anything to add to this point? Yes. Um, well, I think um, our case is almost the same as, uh, as for Happy Fresh. Um, so we were just lucky and, and, um, and our team was just fast enough to respond uh, because at that time, you know, a lot of farmers, uh, because of PSBB, uh, when there's a lockdown, all these restaurants can't operate. So, you know, basically they, they stopped buying from... Um, like agents or, or middlemen. And these middlemen then stop purchasing from the market and then the market stops purchasing from uh, the farmers. So that that was a time when all these farmers were, uh, were panicking, like how can I sell my products? So that's when um, it was easier for us to acquire uh, the farmers to be on our platform. Previously, it was very difficult for us uh, because all these farmers that were more educated, they already had a market. Uh, the less educated ones were the only kind of farmers that could be uh, on our platform. But now we have the we have all um, like the, the the top farmers are also on our uh, platform because you know previously they lost um, their market, so they had to go on board with us and then uh, work with us to uh, to absorb um, their harvest and. You know, we also, even though during the PSBB, we lost a lot of customers on the hotel restaurant catering side, but new um, entrepreneurs, you know, who started selling uh, food online um, or, you know, people who probably lost their job and then like started um, doing other businesses, um, but online, but yeah, like selling food that became really popular um, in Indonesia, especially in, in, the, in the cities. So we, we lost some, but we gained some too. Mm -hmm. Actually, we gained uh, quite a lot. So our B2C uh, traction went significantly uh, up, but also the small B2Bs started, uh, uh, you know, um, coming up because, you know, like a lot of people, uh, we, we saw that, okay, these, are, these guys are purchasing through our B2C app, but the amount of the, um, the goods that they're purchasing is actually uh, not like a household consumption they must be doing a lot of uh, you know doing business so we actually approached them and on, onboarded them to our b2b uh, platform so they can get like cheaper prices and you know wholesale prices so you know the the, the pandemic is actually you know it it it, it made a lot of uh, problems for us but also i think it also opened a lot of opportunities for other people and you know we our team was just we we just were trying our best to be fast enough to uh, capture whatever you know like uh, opportunities was there and, and onboard uh, the incoming customers and also uh, vendors as soon as possible. So that's that's just uh, adding on top of um, what Goem said. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Eka. I think I think I guess for a lot of you all, um, the pandemic has actually opened up a lot of opportunities also for you all to 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 double down also on digitalization. So one question for you, Jake, from the audience, right? Um, social commerce, so this question is asked, so social commerce for agriculture goods and FMCG is getting more popular in Indonesia, Kita Belly, so there's companies like Kita Belly, Chili Belly, et cetera. So what do you think will differentiate the winner in this space? Um, <clears throat> right, so, when you ask question, uh, this question right is about like um, the category of categories of goods that your reseller 
finds it uh, easy to sell, right? So FMCG, uh, fresh produce, right? Um, these are high frequency products. Yeah. Then uh, with competition, we actually know that it's about margin. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you, 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 with high frequency product, you need to hit a certain volume before, you know, your CM1, CM2, and CM3 actually makes sense, right? Uh, for Red S, even though you know, we say that we are PEP agnostic, you know, we, our goal is to ensure that our reseller you know, is able to sell to the end customer, no matter what you want to buy. But our focus is actually on foreign imports. Yeah. Uh, we are able to you know, bring in exclusive brands, things that you, know, uh, you can find on marketplaces, but the product on our side is 30 to 50% cheaper. Uh, it's because you know, the, in T2 and T3, the consumption uh, and the spending power is very different. So, you know, our goal has always been to bring in uh, foreign imports that is uh, good quality, value for money, and also uh, with a strong branding, right? Yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's how we stay competitive. Yeah, so we are not, um, you know, we are, we, are quite, we are quite different, even though we're not in the same space. Yeah, right. And I think uh, I might be, you know, talking too much over already. So, you know, <laughs> I'll, pass, I'll pass the mic back to you. <laughs> No worries, no worries, Jake. But thanks, thanks for sharing the differentiation between the, the social commerce space, right? I think a lot of people also wants to know, right? I guess back to the most final part before we end off this session, right? I think there's also one question which is very similar to the questions that I have also. Looking back at your entrepreneurial journey, right? For the past few years, so what has been some of the key learning so far for you guys? And where do you see your, your company going forward in the next few Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe I will just follow up on that because I have a very quick answer this. Actually, over the pandemic year, right? Uh, what we learned best is the strong values that your co-founding team or your management team set out will define a company culture. And then it's actually strongly related to your mission that the company will then strive to achieve. Why do we feel like this is important, right? It's because we don't have any, we don't have, we are reducing face-to-face -face interaction, right? In the past, right, uh, any issues you meet him, you know, we can deal with it, right? And then, hey, come, let me fly over now, immediately deal with it, and then let's move on. But when you're not able to do that, uh, your management or your teammate, the things that they do, they don't know what's right or wrong, right? And they don't know how to make a decision on that. So they need to reflect back what is the value, right, that your company holds true. Yeah. And then if you can have a very strong values, company culture, and then you know you make sure that you know it's well written out, really strongly related to the mission, right, of the company. Then everyone can move together as one, yeah. And that will help, you know, especially when you are not able to interact as much physically, yeah. So I, I think that is my key lesson uh, over the four years. You need to have a strong value, <laughs> which ties to a strong culture, which is then ties to your mission, and then your company can move together. Yeah. Otherwise, it's quite hard to coordinate <laughs> among all the team. Yeah. Thank you. Dion or Eka, do you want to take this to share some learnings? Uh, well, I think of our, since starting Happy Fresh, right? I mean, our, our history has been an incredibly roller coaster. And I think I, we went from, you know, when we started it, uh, the first year was all good, uh, a lot of excitement from all the aspects. And then we went into a couple of years, a little bit of a darker period. Uh, then we went up again, down again, up again. And I think if, if, if any lesson is that companies are not built in a quarter or in a month, uh, companies are built in, in probably through a much, much longer period. And as a company, as a founder, as a team, to me, I think that is, there's two, two values that, that you have to kind of endure. The first one is resilience. Um, you gotta be extremely resilient. You gotta be you know, uh, extremely willing to have bad days, um, extremely willing to have good days. And in none of these two, you should feel that everything is done. Nor when you are really, really in, 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 a, in like the worst position, nor when you are in the best. So resilience is probably a key, I would say a, a key, a, a, a constant point throughout my journey, Happy Fresh journey and, and overall our team. Um, and the second one, which in, it becomes incredibly important, especially in times like this, is there's the capacity to, to adapt. Uh, the capacity as a team, as a company, to really adapt to, to circumstances that are completely unpredictable. Um, what, what I've been saying a lot these past 12 months to my team is like plans are necessary, but it's unlikely that they happen. 
So yes, you need to plan, but just be ready that that's not what is gonna happen, right? So you need to have a starting point to be like, okay, we wanted to do that, but on the way, just, just go with it. Probably it's not gonna be exactly, but at least you're going somewhere. So that capacity to adapt as a team, to really react very, very fast, uh, to drop ideas that yesterday seemed like the most solid and, and validated and take new ones and run with it. That capacity, I think, would be extremely important um, to, to, to succeed in, in such an unpredictable environment. And I think that's also part of, of, of our journey as inter any entrepreneur, I think. So I think that would be almost like the two, th the two key points I would point out, yeah. Yeah, Thanks, if I could add on top of that, you know, both uh, Jake and uh, Fulim, like basically they said, um, like those are exact things that, um, that I agree on. Um, probably on top of that is just um, don't, don't hold back on uh, holding, uh, uh, recruiting really uh, good talents. That's it. Because um, I, I think that, you know, like having one good uh, player is, is um, that is ex quite expensive. It's much better than having 20 um, clueless um, people. <laughs> so that's it, you know, like um, I, would, I would totally uh, spend um, the money to recruit the best talents. Okay, fantastic. I hope to audience, I hope you have answered all your questions. So on that note, I think we are at the end of our session for today. But let me end off this session with a big thanks to our founders, Eka, Jake, and Guillaume. Thanks for taking time out to share your valuable you. insights. Thank you. I think your company has grown tremendously in the past few years. I think your work is not done here, but I think it's going to be very exciting going forward, right? So. Genesis and myself, I think we are very privileged to be working closely with you all and your team. So I think we look forward to looking to more exciting updates from you all. So, and wishing you all the best as you all become the market leaders in your respective sectors. So thank you everyone and look thank forward you. to you all joining us again in the next forum. Thank you.